The epistle in this uh, feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is uh, from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Brethren, to me, the very least of all saints, there is given this grace to announce among the Gentiles the good tidings of the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all men as to what is the dispensation of the mystery which has been hidden from eternity in God, who created all things, in order that through the church they be made known to the principalities and the powers in the heavens, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him we have assurance and confident access to God through faith in him. For this reason I bend my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth receives its name, that he may grant you from his glorious riches to be strengthened with power through his Spirit unto the progress of the inner man, and to have Christ dwelling through faith in your hearts, so that being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know Christ's love which surpasses knowledge in order that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to be known there. At that time, the Jews, since it was a preparation day, in order that the bodies not, might not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a solemn day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first and of the other, who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance, and immediately there came out water and bl blood. And he who saw it is born witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he tells the truth that you also may believe. For these things came to pass that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall you break. And again, another scripture says, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Those so are the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. And of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The uh, intention of this Mass is for all of the fathers, both living and deceased. Uh, my brothers and sisters, on Corpus Christi, the Church focused our attention on our Lord's real presence in the Blessed Sacrament. This, uh, the following uh, feast, for actually for Friday, but we're allowed to move it to Sunday, uh, the focus is on the love of God that's manifested through Christ's wounded and sacrificial heart, his sacrificed heart. In the Gospel, St. John makes a point of noting that blood and water flowed out from the wound in Christ's side, uh, the wound that went to all the way to his heart. And the, father, the church fathers say that this flow of blood and water was miraculous uh, because uh, once someone is dead, the blood coagulates pretty quickly and doesn't flow. Also, when you think about it, he lost just about an entire body's worth of blood anyway uh, in all the sufferings leading up to the cross. And uh, secondly, there are disagreements among the fathers about the water, whether it came from around the heart or not, um, but the water that's in that, uh, that uh, cavity or sac around the heart 
is really not water uh, that would be flowing. It's, uh, it, it's water that would be, uh, uh, it's more like a mucus type of thing and very thick. And so it's not likely to be flowing. So they, the fathers who point that out say, well, that's a miraculous too. Of course, it uh, has uh, a lot of symbolic meanings. It shows us number one, this is not so symbolic, that Jesus is a true man of flesh and blood because he died. He was able to die. He was not a phantasm. There was a group of heretics called the Docetists that came on early on saying that he was just, uh, you know, like a, not a mirage, but like a angel or something that you could see um, and uh, was not actually man. Um, and a lot of other heresies along similar lines. Um, the water from the um, um, Water stands symbolically for the baptismal waters and the living streams of God's own life. It's often used in uh, prophets like Ezekiel and others, and also in the Psalms. And uh, so the son of the son of man was truly dead, uh, and which means a little further down, three days later, it's a true resurrection. It's not just a, uh, we're not talking about a resuscitation. It's thought by modern scholars that the, uh, uh, some of the, the healings and raisings from the dead that are recorded in scripture are that Jesus would do for others were more like resuscitations. Lazarus obviously was not because he waited four days before he went to him. So, um, with this <clears throat> water and blood coming out, uh, you knew he's dead, and uh, it's a real resurrection. The blood, of course, is uh, a reminder of Jesus' death and, and his statement that there's no greater love than to die for your friends. And then this quote about to look on him who you pierced is from the prophet Zechariah. And that was in connection with God's um, um, pouring out the spirit of mercy on his people once they would come to see the error of their ways, once they would come to mourn their sins. So it's, uh, it's the, uh, there would be, Zechariah goes on to say there would be a spring of water that would arise from the temple itself to purify the people. We uh, Christians often call uh, Jesus' body itself the temple of God. So uh, it's a spirit of mercy. And uh, church fathers say that a soldier opened Jesus' side. This is a little bit more of a reach, but the symbolism is, is uh, kind of very interesting, really. Uh, they opened his side, first off, open. They didn't just say pierce the side, open, like there's a door being open. So it's a door of life that's being thrown open through which the sacraments would flow. As it says, uh, narrow is a gate to eternal life. That gate is the wound in the side of Christ. But it is open and it's most welcoming. St. Paul talks about entering into the mystery hidden from eternity in God, that being the vastness, the infinity, the power of his love, just how much his love, how far his love will go. And uh, he also, uh, the church fathers also compare this opening in the side of Christ with the door in the side of Noah's ark. If you remember Noah's Ark was everyone who was going, to, everyone and only those who were going to be saved entered through that, that door into the ark because everyone else, everything else would be destroyed by the flood. They also trace it to the, um, um, say, yeah, 
They also trace it to the wound in the side of Adam, go all the way back to the book of Genesis at the very beginning. And uh, it, God takes from the side of Adam uh, this, uh, and Jesus is the new Adam, uh, he, and makes a woman. And in Jesus' case, he takes from the side of Jesus the blood and water and makes Mother Church. So all of these sayings are uh, part of a long and rich symbolism. Symbolism doesn't mean it has no meaning. It means it has a great deal of meaning that's very hard to express sometimes. The Sacred Heart devotions, according to Father Gabriel, are the proper object. Proper object of them is actually the physical heart of Jesus center of his humanity. Remember, it's not just the beating organ uh, that we talk about in scripture. It's the very down to the core of Jesus Christ, his humanity. And it is that humanity, that human heart, uh, that is a subject to our devotion, our adoration, <coughs> because it is united with the divinity. The ultimate object of the devotion, the ultimate object of this devotion is Jesus' love. <clears throat> Which Father Gabriel, excuse me a moment. The voice is not cooperating. Father Gabriel points out that Jesus' uh, love is an uncreative love, uncreated love, with, uh, the same love with which the Father and the Son, and Son being uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, has loved us from all eternity. Uh, and, but Jesus' love uh, as a man is the created love to which uh, as a man, he loved us even to the death of the cross, meriting for us by his love that same charity by which we are enabled to love him in return. So Father Gabriel's pointing out is, is through his humanity, his human love, which we think of as always, well, it can be a beautiful thing, but it also has its limits. It is elevated by his divinity to a love that is, is uh, infinite. It is a man wielding God's infinite love. And he's showing us something extremely important, fundamental for us. We can do that. Our humanity, because of his power and his goodness, our humanity will support that. And the love that we have for family, uh, uh, different relatives and friends and so forth, the love we have for our country, the love we have for so many things, uh, and for God himself, I hope, uh, this all comes from God originally, because it is that let me do for you, uh, let me sacrifice for you type of love that isn't natural to us, at least in our fallen state. So loving us in this way as man, through his humanity, Jesus merits for us by his love the same charity by which we are enabled to love him in return. This is more than keeping us out of trouble. We want grace to stay out of trouble uh, with God's law and to help us control ourselves, but it enables us to positively love without limit, or at least close to it, in the way that God loves. Jesus is a true, uh, is the true uh, man wielding God's love. We're called to imitate, to love our neighbor, God and our neighbor on earth and in heaven by sharing in Christ's divine love. This is, it's called elsewhere, a marvelous exchange. That same word sometimes uh, occurs uh, within the Mass itself. And I'll mention that again in a moment. 
in Christ, the eternal love of God the Son and the human love of Jesus, because the two natures are unified, cannot be separated. In other words, if he's going to love us now because of the incarnation and the death and, res and uh, resurrection, he will love us through his humanity and uh, through his human nature. And uh, so the creative love is made sublime by et the eternal love of the Son, so that it becomes the very love of the Son who makes it his own if we allow him to do it, if we ask him to do it. We should want to be, in other words, possessed. You think of possessed, I don't go around being possessed. No, possessed by God. We're going to be possessed by one or the other. We're going to be possessed by God or by Satan. I'll, I'll go with God. I'll go with God. And uh, God's divine love becomes sensible, comprehensible, and tangible to us through the manifestations of his human love, as we should do in all the particulars of our ordinary lives. We meet people who show us kindness, who do things without being asked, who go out of their way to maybe stand up for the truth when somebody needs to get up and speak. That's a mercy too, to share the truth. Uh, these things all come ultimately from God. They come uh, by way of the person who's doing these things, but it's from God. This marvelous exchange is most dramatically realized in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, where the only things of earth, where only ordinary things of earth are taken and they're made sublime by the outpouring of the goodness of God. May God bless you. In the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.